Hey friend, welcome to Job with Julie, hosted by me, Julie Slattery. This podcast is listener supported and it's an outreach of authentic intimacy, a ministry dedicated to helping people make sense of God and sexuality. When we talk about sexuality, one of the foundational truths that changes us as Christians is our identity in Christ. And I found that this is one of the most difficult truths for us to actually live in as Christians. You know, the Bible says that we are new creations in Christ Jesus, and that sounds nice, but it often does little to change how we see ourselves. Instead, we think of ourselves by what we do or how people treat us, or maybe we see ourselves through our shame. A key component of sexual discipleship is really drilling into the idea of who we are in Christ. And that's important in all discipleship, including in parenting. My guest today, Jonathan Holmes, counselor and executive director at Fieldstone Counseling in Akron, Ohio, is going to talk to me about this today. We're going to explore this concept of how you teach kids about their identity in Christ. He recently wrote a book called Grounded in Grace, and that's the topic of that book as well. Now, while his book is centered on parenting, we're going to talk about this idea of identity in Christ and how it applies to parenting, but really how it applies to all of us. So if you are not a parent, this conversation is for you as well. And before I jump in, I want to encourage you to take a minute to rate and review Job with Julie on your favorite podcast app. Your review helps more people find this podcast and provides encouragement for our production team. So without further ado, here's my conversation with counselor Jonathan Holmes. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for being a guest on Job with Julie. This is the first time you've been on the show. It is. And man, I am so excited and so grateful to be here. Well, you've kind of been in my sphere for a while now. We both live in Northeastern Ohio. You're a counselor in the area. I so appreciate the work that you do in counseling and then also just being a voice in the Christian community on some important topics. And one of those topics is identity. (laughs) So, yeah. So, you know, I I don't feel like most people come to counseling asking, help me with my identity. But essentially, that's what probably everybody is asking. So uh, can you talk about just kind of how you came to the conclusion that this is like a topic we need to address head on? I think you're absolutely right, Julia. Like so many people who come into counseling, you know, they're coming with those boilerplate issues of anxiety or depression or marriage and family issues. But what I'm finding so fascinating, especially lately, is so many of those things really being rooted in our understanding of who we are, our identity. Like I'll give you a, for instance, I was talking to a pastor just yesterday in an appointment and he was just talking about some of the struggles that he was going through, a lot of burnout, a lot of just broken relationships with bosses, employers, just leaving different places of employment, really disillusioned. And as we kind of dug into what was leading to some of that burnout, it was just, I am my work. Mm -hmm. So when my work crumbles, I really lose a sense of who I am. So I have to work harder to get other people's approval or affirmation that I'm worthy. And he used words like that I'm worthy, that I mean something, that I'm going to contribute to something, that I'm going to be a part of something greater than myself. And I just said, well, what, what would it look like for you to just rest in who the Lord says you are? And it was a wonderful moment. He goes, I really don't think I know how to do that. Yeah. Because I don't know what that would look like. And it was, you know, we were able to continue the conversation on from there. But again, I don't think he came in thinking he had identity issues, but it was a little bit of a undercurrent to what he was experiencing. Yeah. Boy, if I look at the last probably 30 years of my life and my mm-hmm. walk with the Lord, a lot of it has been identifying lies that I've believed about my identity and oh, really like same. exploring, like, what is it to trust God with who I am? I think, yeah. Jonathan, we use phrases like, oh, you're made in the image of God and God loves you. And we just kind of like, yeah, that's true. But I don't know that any of us naturally like are truly rooted in those things or even know what that practically looks like in terms of how it informs our identity. Yeah, I agree. And I think one of the things I've so appreciated about you and your writings, Julie, is just talking about how the culture around us really impacts us, informs us, like your conversations about sexual discipleship and how people are going to be more than willing to do the work of identity formation 
whether or not we know it or not. And I think that's what's happened to so many of us is the culture around us is more than happy to say, you are this, Mm -hmm. you are this, you are this. And we really do lose out on understanding who we are in the Lord because those kind of just become like altruistic statements and we don't really allow them to connect to daily life. And the culture is happy to provide and step into that void to say, no, we know who you are. We're going to tell you who that is and, you know, go live it out. Mm -hmm. And that's probably been true of cultures everywhere. Like, I think like one of culture's jobs is kind of give us context of who we are and why we have purpose. So have you seen just even historically the way culture informs identity change over time? Oh, absolutely. One of the things I write about in the book is kind of this transition that we've had from more of a traditional identity formation process, which is really historically rooted in your sense of who you were, was about who your parents were, what they did, where you grew up geographically. And that really has taken a shift in terms of how we come into a sense of who we are in a modern identity where we are what we feel. Mm -hmm. So we dig deep inside of our feelings. I'll give you a simple example. The other day, I went to a local boba shop here in green with my girls, and uh, you could take post-it notes and write little messages and post them up all over the wall. And I took a picture of it because it was so striking, Julie. The post-it notes uh, had things like this. You are enough. I'm special. Uh, Believe in yourself. You are the best. It was phrases like that. And I thought to myself, that is so emblematic of our culture, of our culture has told children and teens and now adults, you are special, you are enough. And we've built an entire identity around that. But what happens, I find in counseling is there still is this gnawing sense of, but am I really special? Mm-hmm. I'm not enough. And that's where then so much of the anxiety, the depression filters in because culture is saying, hey, you are enough. You don't need anybody to form your sense of who you are. But deep down inside, we know that's actually not a sustainable way to form out an identity because some days you don't feel special. (laughs) In many days, we don't feel like we are enough. And so the number one thing we typically are telling people in culture is an unsustainable message about identity. Right. Like you are special based on what? Just because you read it on a sticky note? (laughs) Yeah. And I I think even... You know, that was a lot of my search for identity, again, even in adulthood was, okay, you say God loves me, like, I want to know why, like, I want proof of that. And uh, I think when those identities start to feel shallow, or Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that we build our worth on start to crumble, like we start asking those deeper questions of, I've got to have a foundation that I know is secure, that won't be taken away from me. So you've got the larger culture that is sort of sending the meta narrative of who you are, but then you've got smaller cultures, including church culture and family culture that probably are even more impactful in terms of how we formed our identity. And that's really what you've written about is that family culture. Yes. And I think in that family culture, I think you're absolutely right. That meta narrative that runs along the lines broadly in culture has seeped into the church. And so a lot of Christian families I find are doing their best. They're plugging along. They're trying to love the Lord and disciple their children, but they can slip into, I think, an identity formation process that's more heavily weighted towards you are what you do, Mm -hmm. meaning you want to be a good person. You want to be a moral person because that's what God appreciates. That's what God wants. And so we can push things like academic performance, athletic ability, or just plain old Christian moralism of, hey, the goal in life and how you achieve your sense of who you are is by doing good things, achieving good things, uh, being an honorable person. And again, I write in the book that that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not bad to excel in academics or athletics or to be a good or a kind person. But when that becomes the root of who you are, even that is unstable because many times you're not going to be the best performer. You're going to get a B on your exam. You're going to make a bad decision. And if I am what I do and I'm not what God did for me in Christ, I'm ultimately building it on a man-made foundation that at points somewhere along the lines is most likely going to crumble. And so many of the mental health issues, I think that you and I probably encounter day to day in our own ministries, I think Again, that's where the identity piece really is one of, I think, the major underpinnings that people are missing. Mm -hmm. You know, even as you're describing that, I think about my own childhood and how it shaped me. I think about my parenting and how it shaped my children. 
I don't know if you feel this way, Jonathan, as a counselor, but I remember when my kids were like three years old or four years old, like being a psychologist made me even more paranoid because I was like, I know I'm messing them up. (laughs) Like, you know, like I know that someday they're going to be sitting at a counselor's office and be like, oh, my mom did this wrong. Or, And a lot of it gets to this identity stuff because we can't perfectly parent our kids in such a way that has them fully rooted on an identity in Christ. And we do have to shape behavior. Like we do have to have them take school seriously and not hit their brother. And and so, you know, it seems almost impossible to shape the right behaviors in a home environment to value the right things, but not to have the message become your identity is right. rooted in those things. So yes. do you have a well, secret to that? <laughs> well, Julie, no. Well, first, you know, I can commiserate with you. You know, my wife and I joke about having an imaginary therapy fund where yep. we're dropping <laughs> excess income to because we're like, what will our kids say about us, you know, when they're in counseling as adults? And, uh, and for anybody who's listening, just know that, like, parents mess up. Yep. We, we don't always do the right thing. And sometimes that guilt and shame the fear that we can sometimes carry with us as parents, you know, can be overwhelming and just know that every parent's going to mess up and make mistakes. And if our theology of the Lord is where it should be, we realize ultimately we're stewards of our children and our children's lives. We're not in control of it. We control very little, you know, in life, but you're absolutely right. I think that we do have to balance out having rules and having expectations but also really trying to undergird that in the story of the gospel. And I find oftentimes just as a parent, we're not good multitaskers. So to have to balance out, you know, having rules and having standards and curfews and, hey, you can't do that or can't hit your brother, while also maintaining a truly gospel-centered approach to parenting, you know, we can seesaw back and forth between that. And it's really a both and, not an either or. And I think for parents, for many of us, you know, from start to finish, it's going to be a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things I try to tell parents, and I'm sure you echo this too, is I tell parents, it's never too early to start and it's never too late to begin. Mm -hmm. So if you're a parent out there who's discouraged because you're, you know, you've got teenagers, for instance, don't be discouraged. Utilize the time that you have now. You know, parents will say, well, my kid's a sophomore in high school. I'm done. Well, no, you've got three more years, you know, that you could love and disciple and invest. And it's also never too early to start. So from the earliest time that you can communicate and love and be with your children, communicate that message of the gospel to them. Mm -hmm. And I, I think to make matters more complicated, we as parents are still struggling with our own identity issues. You yes, know, you think right. about, we, yeah. Yes, yes, we think that our identity is rooted to our kids. Right. Absolutely. So our kids' is athletic achievements, their academic abilities, their college that they get into. Mm-hmm. Julie, I've heard so many parents, myself included, where my identity is tied up in my kids. Yeah. And that's a, that's a dangerous spot to be in because then we want to manipulate our child to get something out of it for us, which is, you know, never a good plan. <laughs> yeah. And then you're talking about like achievements or college or sports, but let's talk about like some of the sexual issues that impact identity and how they impact both the child, but also the parent who's navigating. Yeah. Like for example, yeah. a kid who is saying, I think I'm gay or a child who is struggling with some gender dysphoria and confusion around right. gender identity. These in some ways are new identity categories. Yeah. It's not that people didn't struggle with same sex attraction historically, or even confusion around identity, but we've, we now live in a time where this becomes who you are as a person. It is 100%. Yeah. yeah. And even and proactively the messages very- like look internally, figure out, yeah kind of where you fall on on the continuum of sexual orientation and gender identity. So I feel like every parent is just like like unprepared for this whole idea. They are. One of the things I was reading a book recently about some of the issues related to gender issues and the authors were saying kids today, they're getting many PhDs from TikTok and Snapchat, Instagram on these topics and coming to their parents with scientific evidence and studies and propaganda that you're right. The average Christian parent just finds themselves really unprepared for. And and Julie, I think you're putting your finger on something too, that a lot of parents have not understood that shift of 
you know, in a traditional identity formation process, same-sex attraction, things of that nature, those were behaviors. They were things people did, but it wasn't necessarily who you were. And today that has definitely shifted. Uh, it's not just an activity or a behavior, but it is an identity. It is, I am, and you can pick from, you know, the entire alphabet of, of identities on that spectrum. And so one of the things I try to help parents with in some of those initial conversations is to slow down and to not immediately center the conversation on themselves, which sometimes is what happens of like, what did I do wrong? Mm. That's almost always, Julie, I don't know about your experience, but one of the first questions parents will typically ask me is, what did we do wrong? Where did we mess up? And not that there's not a time, I think, for thoughtful engagement and exploration of that, but I think we maybe miss the most immediate need, which is, okay, how do we engage this? How do we engage our child, our son, our daughter uh, in a way that honors the image of God in them, but also seeks to engage their concerns, their confusion, their discomfort, lies that they've been told? How can we be ready with answers and conversation to really engage them rather than, you know, immediately defaulting to what did I do wrong? Mm-hmm. And so again, like our, our default as parent is to go towards our identity. (laughs) And I think some of the narratives historically around these conversations have made parents feel even more that way. You know, like if your kid is gay, it's because they don't have a good relationship with dad or, um, you know, like you didn't spend enough time with them. Can you sort of unpack, is there truth to that? Or is it just like, you got to let that stuff go? Yes. Yeah. It's a great question, Julie. I think Early on, maybe in the early 2000s, when a lot of research was being done, especially about uh, maybe the causes or some of the root causes uh, as it related to homosexuality, yeah, people were saying, oh, is it weak relationship with the father, weak relationship with the mother? Is it Mm -hmm. previous abuse or trauma? Is it geographic, et cetera? And uh, I think in the literature that I've read and in the stories that I've heard, yes and no. Mm -hmm. Sometimes kids present with some of those factors in their background. But I've also had many children and teens who struggle with some type of identity on the spectrum, and they have good relationships with their parents and are coming from Christian homes. So I think they can be a factor, but not necessarily are we going to find one deciding factor. I think what underwrites really all of it, though, Julie, is our theology of sin and our Mm -hmm. theology of brokenness in this world of fundamentally, you know, Luther said we are in curvitas in se, we're curved in on ourselves. That's what sin does to us. We want to search deep inside of ourselves for meaning, purpose, and pleasure. And so when culture says, hey, I want to take this one feeling that you might have, this romantic feeling, this attractional feeling, disordered feeling with your body, and I want to just make your entire identity that, there's something I think very appealing to that. And I think for a lot of kids and teens, that coupled with the messages that they're receiving from culture, that meta narrative that is just day in and day out, you know, it's very easy to see how those types of identities seem uh, very safe, very attractive, provides a lot of meaning, a lot of purpose. It even provides a community, right? Like, Mm -hmm. man, if I identify in this way, look at all that I gain here, a community who provides me unconditional acceptance and affirmation. And, uh, you know, for a 14 or 15 year old girl who's searching for that, that's frankly, uh, you know, quite appealing. So, so much of the work I think with parents as they're engaging these conversations is understanding some of those underpinnings. I find parents tend to focus a lot more on the behaviors or the external outworkings of those identities rather than understanding what's really driving some of those conversations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned community. That's such a yeah. key piece. It, um, it seems like we are doing less work on forming the kind of communities that foster identity. If you look back even to when I was a kid, but even more so when my parents were kids, there was such a sense that your community helped define who you are. Right. And yeah. you looked around at your people and they gave you clues to what you should be happy about and sad about and what you Mm -hmm. should value. And that sense of community really doesn't exist today. And I wonder how much sort of the LGBT narrative and community is filling that void. 
Julie, again, I think you're spot on. I think they are. I think they've noticed an opening with the decline of the church. And I say decline of the church, like big C Catholic church mm-hmm. in the sense of the church as an institution in society that people look to for meaning and purpose, all the things that you're mentioning. Tim Keller did a lot of work on this, talking about the decline and renewal of the church. And he said so many of the things that we expect the government to do for us now, historically, people had looked to the church, yeah. whether that was counseling, welfare, food, education, over the past two centuries, that has largely shifted. And so we don't have those communities. And not only, Julie, would I say, do we not have those communities, we fundamentally distrust whatever existing communities or churches are there. So a Mm -hmm. hallmark of Gen Z today is a distrust of religious institutions. And a lot of that's for good reasons. Pastors have morally fallen. Churches have not been faithful stewards of the gospel. So there's a lot of just, I think, mistrust placed. The downside of that, though, is that then they want to put that trust somewhere else. And so you have these communities which are very engaging, very compelling, very vocal, saying, hey, we will accept you no matter what. Mm -hmm. And and again, if you're a 14 or 15 year old boy, a 16 or 17 year old girl who's longing for that, that unconditional acceptance message sounds very appealing to you. And what you hear maybe from the church, especially if you're growing up in a Christian home, is a lot of no's, a lot of prohibitions, uh, maybe not even a lot of talk about sex at all, which I think you know you in your ministry have tried to raise awareness of that, of just, we don't even talk about sex. Mm-hmm. We don't talk about some of these issues in the way that we should. And I think that that has obviously left an opening for another community to step in and say, hey, we will pick up the banner where the church has mm-hmm. dropped off and we'll take care of it for you. Mm -hmm. So Jonathan, I'd love to talk in terms of both reactively, what does a parent do when they find themselves in the situation with their kids? And then proactively, like how do you proactively create the kind of atmosphere and family culture where kids are less likely to be vulnerable to some of these messages? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I'll I'll talk about the reactive first. You know, one of the first things I tell parents is don't overreact and don't underreact. Don't overreact and don't underreact. Engage. Connect with the child in front of you. Connect before we correct. And, you know, a lot of times I'll have a husband and wife come in and the husband and wife are on opposite sides. Maybe the girl is saying, hey, I I think I'm a boy. I want to cut my hair. I want to start wearing jeans, get rid of all clothing that is feminine. The dad, you know, really harsh, no way are you going to be able to do that. The mom, more sympathetic. And so a lot of times the the mom and the dad are not on the same page. It creates a, a lack of unity, even in their own parenting, it exposes maybe issues in their own relationship, but you have an underreactor and an overreactor. And so then what gets lost in the mix is, again, the child in front of us. So what I try to help parents do is to say, okay, looking at the child in front of you, developmentally, depending on their age, what does engagement with his or her concerns look like? And that's something I think that gets missed. We typically want to deal with the 10% of the iceberg, which is their desire to transition or their desire to identify in a certain way, and we miss the larger piece. And something that helped key me off to that, Julie, was I read a story of a well-known detransitioner, somebody who, as a teen, had transitioned to the opposite gender and then really got disillusioned with it and is trying to live out her embodied gender. And in her testimonial, she said, I wish that my parents had understood that the dysphoria that I was feeling was an overall symptom of what I was dealing with, not the underlying cause of Mm. what I was dealing with. And sometimes I think we get that mixed up. So with kids who are experiencing gender discomfort and dissonance, you know, proactively, what I would say is engage that. You know, instead of engaging about the nouns and the pronouns and the clothing, well, tell me a little bit about what's causing you discomfort. Tell me about what you're feeling uncomfortable with. Talk to me about some of the struggles that you're having with your friendships, your relationships at school. What are some of the messages that you're hearing? And a lot of times I think we can get a little bit more conversational momentum and traction there. And the other thing I would tell parents is that it's a series of talks, not one talk. Mm -hmm. You know, I think parents think, okay, sit down on the couch. I'm going to sit and talk to you for 30 minutes and, you know, all the problems are going to be solved. And this is where that Deuteronomy 6 about 
teaching and talking to our children about the Lord comes into play. If we make every conversation from the point of disclosure with our child about their identity, their same-sex attraction, or their gender dysphoria, we actually, I think, play into the world's hands of centering the entire conversation about that identity. And I tell parents, there's a lot of other things that you can talk to and engage your child with other than just this one topic. So broaden out, expand the conversational landscape to be more than just this. So, you know, one girl, uh, she was a sophomore in high school, and she said, ever since I've told my parents that I want to come out and that I think I'm a lesbian, she goes, that is all they will talk to me about. Mm-hmm. They won't talk to me about anything else. Mm-hmm. And it was, a, and her dad heard that, and it was like a light bulb went off of like, oh, I can talk to her about academics, her mm-hmm. sports, her friendships. Not, you know, all roads don't lead back to that, which is what the world wants to say. Yeah. All roads do lead back to your feelings, your romantic and sexual attraction. And the Lord says, no, that might be one part of your story, but it's not the whole story. Yeah, boy, that's good advice. And I think it's not just the cultural messages that make us feel that way. It's, you know, I think about like if one of my kids was diagnosed with cancer and yes. a life threatening illness it would tra- take precedence over everything else. Like yeah. we got to get 100%. doctor's appointments. Like, And we would start to revolve around that so much that you lose sight of who the person is. And I think for a lot of Christian parents, when these sexual issues come up, it's like, you know, alarm bells are going off, red alert, red yeah. alert. Like yeah. <laughs> my kid's soul is in danger. Like this is worse yes. than cancer. We can't yes. talk about anything else until this is addressed and it becomes rightfully so, sort of an obsession, like what book can I get them to read and what counselor can I take them to to get rid of this? So how do you just even in your own processing as a parent, take a step back and not react like this is the worst thing in the world that could have ever happened? Well, I mean, Julie, you know, this is a you know an old counseling trick that all of us use, but it's, you know, helping parents understand what negative emotions they're experiencing in those moments. And Mm -hmm. so talking a lot with parents about negative emotional tolerance. So, hey, when your child is coming out to you, when your child is saying that they want to transition, talk to me about what you're feeling in that moment. And in Julie, a lot of times what I'm hearing from parents is I'm feeling embarrassment. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling like I messed up. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling like I'm a failure. So, all of those are bad motivators for parenting. Because if I'm parenting out of guilt, if I'm parenting out of shame, if I'm parenting out of embarrassment, then in many ways, like you said, it's actually more about my identity and my story than it is who the Lord is and what he's doing in my child's life. So most parents, I'm sure you get this, a lot of parents just are not in touch with their internal life. Mm -hmm. What's going on? What am I learning about my thoughts, my emotions, what's going on in the heart, as it were. And so to name that, so, you know, again, I had a mom recently and she was just saying, I I just feel like I have lost out on a lot of things I was looking forward to. I was expecting grandchildren, a wedding. I was expecting this kind of fairy tale picture of my daughter getting married and now she's out as a lesbian. Mm-hmm. And so the main predominant feeling that she was experiencing was grief. And so talking to her about, well, what do we do? We don't want to project that grief onto her. That's not her issue. She's not making you feel grief. But how do you engage some of those feelings? And in those negative emotions, I think, biblically, we have a pathway back to relationship with the Lord. Uh, We have a God who says, come to me with those negative emotions. Come to me with your shame, your embarrassment, Mm -hmm. your grief, your hopelessness, your sense of betrayal. Like a lot of parents tell me, we feel lied to. We feel like we have been deceived, like especially teens who are on the upper end of their high school who are uh, making these declarations about identity. You know, parents will say this caught us out of the blue. We had no idea. And there's a strong sense of betrayal. Well, the Psalms major on that topic of what do you do when you feel let down? Mm -hmm. What do you do when you feel abandoned? What do you feel when the bottom falls out from underneath you? Well, we serve a God who knows those things and wants to enter into those experiences with us. Yeah. Yeah. As a parent, and you're a parent as well, you have four daughters. Um, You know, one of the the questions that people ask you all the time, and it's an innocuous question is, how are the kids? 
Yes. Like they want to yeah. run down on how are right. each of them doing. It's, and this might not even be people close to you, but acquaintances. And yeah. so parents who have a child who's wrestling, not even just with a gender or sexuality kind of disorder or whatever. Right. You think about eating disorders. You think about kids who can't get out of bed because of anxiety, mm. which is just exploding. You think about kids who are addicted to pornography, all these things, every time somebody asks you how your kids are doing, it probably brings up that same sense of, you know, like, do I lie? You know, and wow. if I'm honest, like, I don't know how to handle that. A lot wow. of dealing with these negative emotions is not just bringing it to the Lord. It starts with that, but also having safe community where people mm -hmm. know the things we're walking through and we don't feel like they're judging us. So yeah. how do you start to reach out and build that kind of community, particularly within the church culture that can tend to maybe at times be a little judgy. <laughs> yes. No, no. I think you're right. And you're being kind and saying just a little, I think a lot of times we can be pretty judgy and I don't know, Julie, I mean, maybe the best encouragement is, you know, take that step of faith, take a step towards vulnerability. Maybe it's in a, a mom's group. Maybe mm -hmm. it's in a community group, a Sunday school class, a, a men's Bible study group that you're a part of. But being honest about some of those struggles of, hey, yeah, could you pray for us? And I'm going to give a specificity about the prayer I need. We're having some struggles with our oldest daughter or our middle son. And we don't need to go into details, but, you know, everything is not just okay. Mm -hmm. And I think if we could start introducing some of that vulnerability, I find that vulnerability draws people out of the woodworks, especially mm -hmm. when it happens with somebody in a position of leadership, because people feel a safety of, oh, you too? Mm -hmm. Oh, let me, let me, you know, it's like in a small group, it's like if one person goes and is even a little bit vulnerable, it tends to draw people out. I was yeah. just talking to somebody before this call about they were in a group setting, somebody asked a question, it was really quiet. And then one person led with vulnerability and they said the other 45 minutes of the conversation, you couldn't shut people up mm -hmm. because they were just wanting to talk and converse. So, you know, Julie, I think you're right. If we can really push parents towards those types of communities in their local church, ideally, where they can start having some of those conversations, I think that would be key. Back in the day, probably 10 years ago, when I do seminars on sexuality and gender, I would say, how many of you know someone who struggles uh, with same-sex attraction, gender dysphoria, raise your hand. There'd maybe be 10 to 15% of the hands would go up in the room. Mm -hmm. I ask that question now when I teach, every hand yep. goes up in the room without fail. Yeah. Um, the scope and magnitude of this coming to our homes, our dinner tables, our minivans, all over the place. Yeah. And you and I, uh, being in more of a clinical field, we have behind-the-scenes look on, yeah. okay, I know these people socially and the things that they look like they're experiencing. And then I know what's really going on in their homes. Yes. And it's yes. really helped me to understand we are all broken. And yes. there's nobody who has perfect <laughs> children who, who has done this right or has a perfect marriage. And if we can create those spaces within the church where we can even start with that with that leveling yeah. of, yes. you know, yes. we, we all have things that we're ashamed yes. to say out loud because we're not sure if we'll be judged yes. for it. And somebody I, has to go I, first. <laughs> yes. I tell people all the time, I go, don't ever think for a moment, especially even me in writing with hesitation, a book on parenting. Don't ever think that we have a perfect family. If so, just come to dinner at my house. Yeah. Come on a Sunday morning to my house when we're trying to get ready for church. We're all equally broken. We're all equally in need of a savior. And Again, it's one of my mantras in counseling of we are more like the people that we meet with than we are different. Yeah. The expressions of sin and brokenness might look different, but the core struggle of sinners in need of a savior, sinners in need of the good news of the gospel, that is true of me, it's true of you, and it's true of every person uh, that we have the privilege that we mm, meet with. Amen. And now we are not going to be able to perfectly parent our kids, no matter how old they are, to reflect their identity in Christ. Yes. So, but we can <laughs> approximate it. There are some we things can. we can do to really help establish that foundation. What advice do you have? 
Yeah. Well, you're right. We can't control it, but we can definitely influence it. And so what I would encourage parents is it's never too early and it's never too late to sow those seeds, sow those seeds of a Christ-centered identity. And one of the things I talk about in the book and that I talk about with parents and counseling is typically a parent's voice is going to be the loudest and most shaping voice for children, especially younger children. So you want to, as a human ambassador of God, to communicate God's words to your children as much as possible. So early on in childhood, I'm telling my things like, God is for you. God created you. God loves you. God is with you. I'm wanting to communicate God's words in God's voice to them so that his voice becomes the dominant and shaping voice. As my kids get older and they are in their teen years, their early adolescent years, the sophistication of God loves you and God is for you and God is with you, it's going to change. It's going to be more contextualized to the different struggles that they're going through. Hey, God understands the struggles in your friendships. He understands what it's like to be lied about. He understands what it's like to be betrayed. But here's what we know to be true about the Lord and how he views you in the midst of all those struggles is he is eager for relationship with you and that his words about you and to you are good and right and necessary. We need to hear what God's words are about us. And so I'm trying to communicate that, albeit imperfectly with my kids all the time. I don't know about your kids, Julie, but my kids call that counselor mode. <laughs> so when I start talking, they're like, stop counseling us. And I'm like, I'm not trying to counsel you. I'm just trying to share with you who the Lord is and what he says about you. So maybe it's on a walk in the evening. Maybe it's on the way to carpool up to school. Maybe it's after a sporting event where they don't perform how they want. My middle daughters play basketball and before each and every game, I look them in the eyes and I say, regardless of if you win or lose, right, God loves you. Your worth is not in how you perform on that basketball court. And that conversation plays out in a million different ways across a million different meals and conversations. But it's that steady drumbeat of I want my voice to embody God's voice to them as early and as often as mm-hmm. possible. Mm-hmm. Jonathan, those messages are beautiful, and they're very consistent with what God says. When we read the Bible, we also see that there are some harder messages of what God says about us. And sometimes um, I think parents, particularly in our culture, can only say the positive and not deal with calling out our sin nature, how God responds to our sin, our need for repentance, even where is God in the middle of our weakness. Right. So how do yes. we also reflect that aspect of our relationship with the Lord? Yeah, 100%. I, I think that that's actually an area that even for my own upbringing, I probably don't highlight that enough in my own parenting because I grew up in more of a legalistic background. So mm-hmm. my portrayal of who God is sometimes can be an overreaction to even my own upbringing. But you're absolutely right. I would say one of the main dominant messages I try to communicate with my children is just the fact that God deserves our worship. Mm -hmm. He's worth being praised. And there are so many different ways that I want to constantly give that worship to other things and other people. I want to find and worship my own desires, my own way. I want to treat people in a certain way. I want to earn approval from other people, which are all misguided worship attempts from what we really should be worshiping. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the conversation I have with my kids is about that of, hey, where's their disordered worship? You know, we talk a lot in counseling about heart idolatry. And I think sometimes that phrase for kids might not be as helpful or might be a bit more unfamiliar, but they get the idea of values, beliefs, trust, loves, disordered loves of, hey, I think that you are loving this more than what you were designed for. You're loving the creation more than the creator. You're loving what you think other people think about you and value you more than who the Lord is and what he says about you. And so many of the conversations I'm having with my kids right now about friendships and relationships, Mm -hmm. it's about, it's dominated, right, by what other people think about them. And and the corrective to that is, man, do you you care about who the Lord is and what he thinks about you? Because that's the one opinion that really counts. But our hearts 
right, are constantly drawn away from the Lord. We know that from Isaiah 53, 6, and we know we're like sheep that have gone astray. So that pull towards other things to fulfill us and give us meaning, I think constantly has to be addressed, especially in children and teens, to just bring that awareness to them uh, in the moment. Yeah. And maybe one way to do this, particularly with teens, is to point out the ways that we're doing that. So, you know, like just lead by humility of God really Um, convicted me that I'm putting too much emphasis on this, or I care too much about what these people say, or I acted this way because I had the wrong priority on, on this hobby. So that can be helpful too, in terms of modeling that. Yes. uh, A good dose of self-reflection is always needed. (laughs) Yes. yeah, Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned legalism. What does it look like when parents who want to honor God and want their kids to honor God end up communicating an identity based in legalism? Yeah. Well, Julie, I dedicate an entire chapter in the book to that on a Christian moralism, legalism. And I think, again, well-intentioned, but bad execution, meaning that we take our beliefs about who the Lord is, God is holy, He's just, but then we heavily add to that our own requirements and our own versions of righteousness. And that really gets externalized, I think, with our kids. Uh, We want our kids to act a certain way, behave a certain way, don't talk in church, don't hit your brother as we're, you know, headed into the service. And we can really create within our kids a model that, listen, you are loved and accepted if you behave in a certain way, meaning that activity defines my identity. My good activity informs my identity rather than it being the other way around of no, my identity informs my activity Mm -hmm. of when I love the Lord, when I'm in right relationship with the Lord, then I will want to follow the Lord. I will want to obey the Lord. Obedience doesn't merit Christ's favor and Christ's blessing. But when we are in Christ and when we are united with him, an outcome of that is that we will want to please the Lord. We will want to, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, we will want to live the life worthy of the calling that we have received. And so I think for parents, it is a both and. We still have to have rules and guidelines and standards in the home. That's just what's needed to make a home go well. But we never want to miscommunicate that adherence to those standards is what makes people right with the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so communicating that message, I think, to our children as well as to our own hearts. So especially for a lot of people within my generation, I think, who grew up more in that legalistic environment, we have to constantly be aware of that, I think, and rightly run to the freedom of the gospel and the message that the gospel gives to us. Yeah. And I don't even know if it's just our generation, but also like I see sometimes in very conservative homes or very conservative churches, the way to keep our kids from being impacted by culture is to kind of double down on righteousness and rules. And we do things differently, which can lead to shame for a kid who's not doing well, but also some of that pharisaical, like... Yeah, I mean, I was just having a conversation with a teenager yesterday who is in a great Christian home, you know, but he was talking about people he knows that identify as gay and there's a lot of anger and, you know, just kind of like, I don't get it. Like why the Bible's right. clear. I don't know why they don't obey. If you're in Christ, you're not going to disobey. And I'm like, okay, you know, like <laughs> there's a lot of growth that's needed there when that's our posture too. I mean, we're all growing we're all on this journey and to expect like a 15 year old or 16 year old to understand their identity in Christ is probably not going to happen. Uh, right. Yeah. Yes. And, so, and I think that's where understanding your child's developmental stage and making sure that the maturity that they're currently at maps onto your expectation of knowledge and being able to engage in some of those conversations. So yeah, I'm not expecting my 15 year old daughter to talk like a 64 year old systematic theologian, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but the conversations that we can have are still can be just as robust and just as meaningful and just as theological, but it's going to be contextualized really for our children. So, you know, I'm thinking of an example, just in conversation with my daughters, you know, the number one topic that we talk about now probably is relationships. It's about things they're experiencing in their friendships, 
hurts, betrayals, gossip, envy, jealousy, mm-hmm. things of that nature. And I think we've had some of our most robust conversations about identity connected to those struggles with their friendships of, yeah, there are going to be times when people let you down. There are going to be times where people do stuff that you don't understand. There are going to be times that people, you know, leave you out and connecting that back to, that's why there's something so unique and special about our faith that we actually have a recourse. We have a refuge that we can run to with these things that we don't have to just run out to other people to get that meaning and purpose. Like, we'll just get new friends or just if I was more beautiful, if I was more smart or more athletic, which is essentially the model that the world puts together of, you know, be more fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. You know, you are enough, you are special, but not quite enough. You need to work harder for it. You know, the message of the gospel is so countercultural. And it reminds us really of what, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that the wisdom of the cross is foolishness to the world. So what makes sense biblically oftentimes does not make sense culturally. Mm -hmm. And what I hear coming through this time and time again, as you're sharing is it takes time and um, teenagers are busy. Kids are busy. Parents are busy. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And I think even when you get to those teenage years, often we can get the message that our teenagers don't want to spend time with us, or we don't know how to connect with them. What practical advice do you have for parents in terms of creating that space to have these kinds of conversations along the way? Right. The comparison I give it to is, you know, we want microwave parenting and it's probably more crockpot parenting. You know, it's Uh long and slow and takes some time. I'm a big fan of, you know, what the Puritans used to call redeeming the common. So redeem every moment you can the carpools, the rides in the vehicles, the after sports events, conversations, the times where you do have 100% of their attention and the times when you don't think they're listening at all, but something you say plants a seed. And I just tell them, I try to encourage parents with Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If our parenting is really grounded in the goodness and sovereignty of God, then we know that no good conversation will be wasted. Mm -hmm. God is going to be faithful to bring those things into fruition in his timing, which relieves an enormous burden off of us as parents, but also places a high calling and responsibility on us as parents because we need to be planting those seeds. So I encourage parents, take advantage of those conversations. You know, not to be legalistic, but I would say eat as many meals together as you can try to do as many things together as a family that you can monitor that social media and technology usage. So, you know, if your kids have phones, like we have a no phones at the table rule, a no phones in your bedroom rule. And again, that doesn't make people righteous before the Lord, but what it might do is remove a distraction so that we can have a conversation about the beauty and truthfulness of who the Lord is around the dinner table. Well, if you're a parent, I really hope this episode encouraged you. And even if you're not a parent, my hope is that this conversation has helped you realize maybe some ways that you've been putting your identity on shallow foundations instead of really digging into what it is to trust Christ for your identity. If you want to get a copy of Jonathan's book, it's called Grounded in Grace, Helping Kids Build Their Identity in Christ. And we've included a link to that in our show notes. You'll also see a link to a special resource we've created on sex and culture, which ties in really well to what Jonathan talked about today. So I hope you'll check that out. Next week, you'll hear my conversation with Jackie Hill Perry, which is incredibly exciting as she's going to be one of our speakers at the Reclaimed Conference next Friday and Saturday in Middlebrook Heights, Ohio. And if you still haven't signed up for Reclaim, it's not too late. Just click in the show notes for more details and to register. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for joining me, and I'll see you next Monday for more Java with Julie.